legalism. It's one of the most pervasive problems in the church today, right next to licentiousness. And while the licentious Christian is completely convinced that they can just continue to live in sin because, well, they think God's grace provides them with a license to sin, uh, the legalistic Christian, on the other hand, is equally confused after coming to the conclusion that those who want to live a life that's truly pleasing to the Lord must make sure that they're imposing all of their personal convictions on the lives of everyone else who's within their own sphere of influence. And so the legalistic Christian goes around taking all of their uh, personal rules and, and regulations and attempts to impose them onto others. In this way, the legalistic believer spends their time attempting to accomplish, uh, the, uh, they, t- they attempt to accomplish the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit by trying to control other Christians through the limitations of legalism. Now, if this sounds like something that you struggle with, then it's my hope that our study today will help you to realize that the limitations of legalism won't help anyone to become a better believer. Trust me when I tell you that the limitations of legalism will not help anyone to become a better believer. And as we make our way through the text before us today, we're going to begin to see, first of all, that legalism results in the limitation of oppression. Secondly, we'll learn that legalism will result in the limitation of persecution. Thirdly and finally, we'll see that legalism results in the limitation of restriction. Well, with this as our outline, let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 11. Here we find the Lord Jesus. He finds himself face to face with a lawyer who was, well, less than pleased with our Savior. And as you make your way to the 11th chapter of Luke's gospel account, I just want to spend a second putting our text back into its context. It'll first help us to remember that it was in our text last week when we learned about that day when there was this unnamed Pharisee who invited the Lord Jesus over to his home for dinner or for supper, depending on where you're from. Sadly, he was quick to criticize Christ after realizing that Jesus didn't bother to wash his hands before dinner, and this was a big deal to him. In response to that self-righteous Pharisee who who challenged Jesus about his hand-washing routine, uh, the Lord then turned around and challenged this guy about his hypocrisy. Yeah, the Pharisee, he had clean hands, but he had a filthy heart. And he, and, and he was hiding sins uh, within his heart while washing his hands and, and putting on a show of it. So he rebukes the Pharisee for his hypocrisy. And, and here in our text tonight, now we find this legalistic lawyer stepping forward in order to defend his self-righteous friend. And with all this context in mind, let's pick up our study of Luke chapter 11. I, I want to begin studying there at verse 45. Here we learn that one of the lawyers answered and said to him, Teacher, by saying these things, you reproach us also. And he said, Woe to you also, lawyers, for you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore, the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves, and those who were entering in, you hindered. And as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse him. Now, here in these verses, we find this unnamed lawyer. He's actually stepping forward to challenge the Lord Jesus, especially regarding the way that Jesus had rebuked the foolish Pharisees for their sins of self-righteousness. And I should remind you here that Christ Jesus concluded this scathing rebuke by including the sins of the scribes. As a matter of fact, I just want to take a second to back up and look at the last verse from our study last week. It's there in Luke 11, verse 44, where the Lord Jesus broadened the scope of this scathing rebuke by declaring, woe to you, scribes, 
and Pharisees, hypocrites. And so the, the bulk of the rebuke was uh, focused on the Pharisees, but then in the final verse, he, he then broadens the scope to the scribes and the Pharisees. And as soon as he included the scribes, that's when this lawyer decided that Jesus, well, he had gone too far. He had gone too far. Now, now, just to be clear about this, it'll help you to know that the scribes, they're actually mentioned over 60 times in the New Testament. And just to be clear about this, the scribes were these religious leaders who were well-versed in the Mosaic law and other sacred writings. And scribes not only spent their time examining the more difficult and subtle questions about the law, but they were also called upon to act as legal advisors for those who had questions about the law. According to one source, scribes were honored professionals whose modern day equivalent would be that of judges or lawyers. That being the case, it seems to me that this lawyer found here in our text today was more than likely a scribe. Now, there were lawyers who were Pharisees, there were lawyers who were scribes, so it could have been gone either way. But, but as we consider what the lawyer says here, it seems like it was when Jesus rebuked the scribes that he stepped in and said, hold on a second, now you're bringing me into this whole thing. As a matter of fact, uh, look with me again here at Luke chapter 11, verse 45. Here we learn that the lawyer answered and said to him, teacher, by saying these things, you reproach us also. So he's saying, hey, you, you were talking about the Pharisees. I was sitting quiet, but then you brought up the scribes, and now you're, you're, you're challenging us. You're rep reproaching us. That word reproach, well, it refers to the statements that are intended to bring shame upon a sinner. Uh, the word reproach was also used to describe the way that a person would injure another with insulting words. It's for this reason that the scholars who created the new international version of the Bible, they render verse 45 in this way. One of the experts in the law answered him, teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. He was insulted. This lawyer was insulted because Jesus publicly exposed the hypocrisy of both the Pharisees <clears throat> and the scribes. Now, I have no doubt that there are many who would struggle with the idea that, you know, our sweet Savior Jesus would insult someone. Uh, and, and, and so clearly, you know, Jesus is gearing up for an apology because, you know, Jesus would never want to insult anybody, right? It might be difficult for us to imagine that our loving Lord was, was willing to shame those religious leaders by referring to them as hypocrites. And, and the fact is that, that Christ Jesus was constantly rebuking the, the religious leaders of Israel. He was constantly presenting them with challenges that to them were insults. But in reality, it, it was just true. Christ Jesus was quick to criticize the self-righteous rulers of Israel for their hypocrisies. And rather than presenting this lawyer with an apology, rather than saying, you're right, you know, this should be a safe space for everyone and I wouldn't want anybody to feel offended. No, no, none of that. He doubled down on the denunciation. As a matter of fact, look with me again there at verse 46. Here the Lord Jesus turns to the lawyer and says, woe to you also, lawyers. Wow. So he's, he's rebuking the, the Pharisees. He brings in the scribes. This guy's offended. And, and Jesus, instead of apologizing, says, no, no, I'm about to give you some more here. Woe, he says, to you lawyers. It's important to remember that the word woe is translated from a Greek word, which was an exclamation of grief, which typically involved an accusation and even a denunciation of the person being rebuked. Uh, therefore, rather than apologizing for hurting the feelings of this sensitive lawyer, uh, the Lord Jesus turned his attention to, to this defensive lawyer uh, by then calling him a hypocrite and exposing his hypocrisy. Now, with this in mind, let's look again there at verse 46, where Jesus actually declares, Woe to you also, lawyers, for you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers." Here we find Jesus accusing the lawyers there in the land of Israel of using the law as a means of oppressing the people of God. As a matter of fact, uh, the word that's translated burden here, it actually comes from a Greek word which was used metaphorically in reference to the ceremonial observances which were rigorously exacted and increased upon by human traditions. So they would take the law of God and then they would create traditions based on those laws and make them even harder uh, by you know, increasing the amount of hoops that you've got to jump through just to try to keep the law itself. That's what they were doing. They were burdening the people with all of their rules and rituals. Thayer describes the word burden as the religious precepts which the Pharisees used to oppress the people. The scholars who created the New Living Translation, they present verse 46 with even more clarity by rendering the Greek in this way. 
what sorrow also awaits you experts in religious law, for you crush people with unbearable religious demands and you never lift a finger to ease the burden. In other words, the legal experts there in Israel were oppressing the people of God by loading them down with the heavy weight of religious requirements, which they themselves were unwilling to bear. They weren't trying to lift these heavy burdens. No, they were just using them to oppress the people of God. Those legal experts had become legalistic leaders who didn't have any problem placing oppressive limitations on the people that they were trying to control. And what this means is that legalism always results in the limitation of oppression. In order to further grasp my point, we should take some time to consider the way that Paul addressed a group of legalists who showed up at the church in Antioch. And so with this as the focus, hold your place here in the Gospel of Luke and let's turn in our Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. See, it's here in the second chapter of Galatians where we find Paul. He's uh, recounting the day when he ended up challenging the apostle Peter. And the reason why is because Peter had uh, began to side with a group of legalistic leaders who became known as Judaizers. These Judaizers were trying to oppress the Gentile believers there in Antioch you know, with all of the legalistic uh, restrictions of the law. And it's for this reason that, that Paul actually went out of his way to rebuke Peter and the rest of the Jews there in Antioch by reminding them about the limitations of the law. Let's consider how Paul puts it here in Galatians chapter 2. If you would look with me there, beginning at verse 11, here Paul informs us that when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you... Being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews. Why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. If you have the liberty to write in your Bible, I encourage you to underline that passage. By the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Paul was publicly rebuking the apostle Peter. And the reason why is because Peter was allowing a group of legalistic leaders to come in and oppress the Gentile believers by, uh, by uh, taking the restrictions of the old covenant and, and, and trying to enforce them upon these Gentiles. Rather than simply embracing the Gentile believers as, as Christians who are on the same level as they were, they instead rejected those who were failing to follow the limitations of the Levitical law, all the while they too were failing to you know, follow all of the limitations of the Levitical law. Peter also allowed the oppression of legalism to restrict his own relational connections with the Gentile believers. He began to limit his interaction with those Gentile believers. And it's for this reason that Paul took the time to remind him that, listen, we're all in the same boat together. No one is going to be justified by the works of the law. The law never justified a Jew, and the law will never justify a Gentile. And the reason why is because the law was given to condemn and to show us our guilt. I like the way that Paul put it in Romans chapter 3. It's there where he says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and that all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law was given not to save us. No. The law was given so that we might understand our need for salvation. The law wasn't given as, as a you know, as a, a set of hoops to jump through. And if you can just get through it just fine, then you'll be safe. No, no, the law wasn't given as a hurdle to jump so that, you know, hopefully you can make it over the top. No. The law was given so that we might understand how guilty we are before God. 
The law was given to provide us with an objective way of understanding that we have fallen short of God's perfection. And since it's true that the law of God is unable to save us from our sins, then it's also true that the legalist who tries to convince people that they need to work their way to heaven according to the works of the law, they are actually guilty of burdening those people with the religious restrictions that they themselves are failing to maintain. That's what legalism does. It results in the limitation of oppression by placing the burden of the law on others while, the, the, while, while these people are unable to do what they're requiring of, other, of others. And so we see then that legalism results in the limitation of oppression. And not only that, but secondly, legalism also results in the limitation that results in persecution. And in order to explain what I mean by this, let's make our way back now to Luke chapter 11. Here we find Christ Jesus continuing to challenge this legalistic lawyer about his own hypocrisy. And if you would look with me once again, beginning at verse 47, here the Lord rebukes the, the lawyer by declaring, Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore, the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. Now, uh, here in these verses, we find Jesus presenting this second woe. He's presenting another woe to this lawyer who was offended by the harsh rebuke that the Lord lodged against the scribes and the Pharisees. And in order to better understand the reason for this second woe, you should take some time to consider the historical context that Jesus here is referring to as he accuses the lawyers there in Israel of celebrating their forefathers by building these tombs you know, for, for them, all the while failing to recognize that these were the very men you know, who were guilty of murdering the prophets of God. With this as the focus, let's back up and take a closer look at this second woe, beginning once again at verse 47. Again, Jesus declares, Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. He says, your fathers killed the prophets and you celebrate them by, by you know, building these elaborate tombs. He says, in fact, you bear witness that you approve of the deeds of your fathers for they indeed killed them and you build their tombs. Now, for the sake of clarity, it'll help you to know that Jesus here, he's not referring to the men that literally fathered these lawyers. He's not saying your dad. No, no, he's, saying, he's talking about the forefathers of Israel. And he's saying, hey, your, your forefathers, the, the very people that you celebrate here, are guilty of killing the prophets of God. In order to further grasp this accusation, it'll help you to know that the forefathers of Israel had a very long-running history of persecuting the prophets that the, that the God of Israel had raised up to go and rebuke the people for their idolatries. As soon as the, as soon as the people of God would slip off into, into idolatry, God would raise up a prophet to go and rebuke them. And, and how were they treated? Well, they were persecuted and killed. This is the point that Jesus goes on to make there in verse 49, where he declares, therefore, the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute. Now, that word persecute is translated from a Greek word which speaks of torment and torture. The same Greek word, well, it was used of those who inflict pain upon those they persecute. And according to Christ Jesus, you know, God had already informed them that this is what they would do. God had already revealed that the religious leaders of Israel were going to uh, afflict the prophets that, that God raised up to rebuke them. And it's sad to say that there were many who ended up being persecuted even to death. As a matter of fact, just to give you a brief snapshot of what we're talking about here, you should know that King Manasseh had the prophet Isaiah cut in half with a wooden saw. It's also believed that King Ahaziah struck the prophet Joel in the head with a wooden staff, resulting in a, a, an injury that ended his life. Uh, there was a priest from Bethel who is said to have tortured the prophet Amos before ultimately killing him. The prophet Habakkuk was stoned to death in Jerusalem as the Jews pelted him with stones. Uh, the Jews also stoned Jeremiah because he rebuked them for worshiping idols. And, and as well, the prophet Ezekiel was stoned to death after he showed up and rebuked the chief of the Jews uh, for his worship of idols. These were all prophets of God who were killed by the people of God. 
And Jesus sums up this horrific history of persecution there in verse 51 by declaring, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, from A to Z, you've killed the prophets of God. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah who perished between the altar and the temple, yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. The Lord was reminding his audience about the way that the people of faith had been persecuted and put to death ever since the days of Cain and Abel. The story is actually found in Genesis chapter 4 where we learn about the day when Cain killed his brother Abel. And the reason why is because the Lord had rejected the offering that Cain presented. And please understand that Cain, uh, you know, took, you know, the leftovers. Cain took, you know, fruit that had fallen to the ground and, and out of a legalistic obligation presented this to the Lord. And the Lord wasn't pleased. He wasn't impressed. Abel, on the other hand, he took the best of his flock, presented that out of faith and because he was worshiping the Lord. And the Lord was pleased with his offering. And so Cain, you know, being disappointed because God didn't care for his legalistic offering, turned around and decided that he was going to kill his brother. And that's what he did. Cain murdered his brother Abel because, well, that's what legalists do. They persecute the people that they're offended by. Then after mentioning the murder of Abel, the Lord Jesus then leapt forward in time to the murder of Zechariah. According to Jesus, it was the prophet Zechariah who was put to death between the altar and the temple, and this took place during the 5th century B.C., about 25 years after the temple was rebuilt there in Jerusalem. Now, the reason for this was due to the fact that the prophet Zechariah was sent to warn the people of God about the way that the legalistic leaders of Israel would eventually lead them away from their Messiah and then be judged for rejecting their Redeemer and ultimately for murdering their Messiah. A brief snapshot of this can be seen in Zechariah chapter 9. There we find the prophet Zechariah declaring, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. This prophecy that was presented through the mouth of Zechariah, it points to the day when the Messiah would enter Jerusalem riding on a young donkey. And it's sad to say that as Zechariah continues to, to reveal the prophetic word of God, that you know, the, it, it turns to rebuke, you know, knowing that the people were going to turn away from their Messiah, and so that's why they killed Zechariah. And yet just as he prophetically revealed by the power of the Holy Spirit, there came the day when the Messiah showed up riding a young donkey, and he rode it into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday as the people laid palm branches before that donkey. And, and, and they sang, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Just as Zechariah had foretold, Jesus accomplished that prophecy. But rather than looking forward to this day and rather than rejoicing in the fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy, the legalistic leaders there in Israel they also fulfilled Zechariah's prophecy by becoming those leaders who were rejecting their Messiah. And as Jesus rode up to Jerusalem and the people began to sing that song of praise, the legalistic leaders of Israel stepped forward and told Jesus to silence his disciples. That's what they wanted. They weren't interested in having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. They weren't interested in meeting their Messiah. No, instead they stepped forward to persecute the Lord Jesus Christ by telling him to silence his disciples. Not only that, but it was the same legalistic leaders who followed in the footsteps of their forefathers by looking for a way to legally murder their Messiah according to the Old Testament law. That's right, rather than embracing the one who came to save them from the condemnation of the law, rather than, than embracing the Messiah who, who uh, you know, was foretold by all the prophets, they instead looked for a legal way to put him to death. They conspired against Christ Jesus so that they could use the law to put him to death. As a matter of fact, it's in Matthew chapter 26 where we learn that the high priest called for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ but only after they agreed that Jesus had broken the law, he had committed blasphemy according to them, and that he was deserving of death. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ never blasphemed. And yet this was their legal loophole for being able to call for his crucifixion. They used the law to lead Jesus to the cross. 
In light of this, we can see that the legalistic leaders of Israel, they weren't interested in developing a relational connection with their kinsman redeemer. No, instead, they were more concerned about maintaining their control over the people of Israel by the manipulation of the law. And in order to maintain that control, they were ready to persecute the Lord Jesus Christ and his apostles. In order to further prove my point, let's consider the assessment that was made by a disciple named Stephen. We find this at the beginning of the church age. It's in Acts chapter 7. So hold your place here in the Gospel of Luke and let's turn to the the book of Acts. If you would, let's turn to Acts chapter 7. You see, it's here in the seventh chapter of Acts where we find a Christian named Stephen. You know, he's challenging the legalistic leaders of Israel, you know, the ones who had just crucified Christ Jesus. And he was challenging them to realize that they were making the same mistakes that their forefathers made when they killed the prophets. Let's consider Luke's record of this conversation that's found here in Acts chapter 7. If you will, let's skip down to verse 51. It's there in verse 51 where Stephen declares to those legalistic leaders, he says, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Stephen here is reminding these religious leaders in Israel about the way in which their forefathers had persecuted the prophets of God who you know, were prophetically pointing to the coming of Christ Jesus. The, their forefathers didn't want to hear those prophecies and instead they killed those prophets. And Stephen here now is accusing these legalistic leaders of fulfilling the prophecies by becoming the betrayers and murderers of the Messiah. And while it's true that they were quick to use the law of God that they had received, they were, they were using the law for their own legalistic purposes, it's also true that those legalistic leaders were failing to keep the law themselves. They weren't interested in trying to keep the law. They only wanted to use the law to persecute the people they wanted to persecute. As a matter of fact, let's consider how Stephen ends up being persecuted by these, by these very people. It's here in Acts chapter 7, beginning at verse 54. Here we learn that when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he being full of the Holy Spirit gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens opened and the son of man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now here in these verses, we find these legalistic leaders there in Israel. They're deciding that it's time to stone Stephen to death. Why? Well, because they were convicted in their heart. They heard what he said. They were convicted, they were cut to the heart, and they didn't want to hear it anymore. And they determined right there on the spot that he had just committed blasphemy by suggesting that Jesus Christ, whom they just murdered, was standing there in heaven. Rather than coming to grips with the reality that they were the ones who murdered the Messiah, they instead then used the law of God in order to justify their decision to stone Stephen to death. Notice again, they carried him outside of the city. Why? Well, because that's what the law said to do. You don't stone stone someone inside of the city. According to the law, you take them outside of the city gates and you stone them out there. And you have the right to stone them if they commit blasphemy. And so they're, they're taking the law and they're saying, see, we're doing it all according to the law. And yet all the while they're breaking the law because Stephen wasn't a blasphemer, and blasphemer nor, nor was Jesus Christ. In light of their example, we see that legalistic people typically try to impose limitations on the people of God through religious persecution, all the while thinking that they're serving God and doing it. Now, if you're someone who has suffered at the hands of a legalist who has persecuted you, then it's important for us to remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. It's there where he declares, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, 
for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Christian, listen, if you find yourself being persecuted by legalistic people who try to use the law of God to oppress, oppress you, then I encourage you to remember that this is actually reason to rejoice. Oh, it doesn't feel that way. Sometimes it's painful to suffer the persecution of those who try to take the law of God and, and use it to club us over the head. But listen, there's reason to rejoice according to Jesus. And the reason why is because this is actually evidence of our relationship with Christ Jesus. At the same time, though, it's possible that you're the person who loves to use the law of God to punish those who you deem to be less than perfect. And if you're that person, if you're the person who loves to take the law of God and, and you walk around you know, trying to impose restrictions on other people and, and try to you know, persecute those who don't really fall in line with, with you know, your rules, it's important to realize that you might be the one who's guilty of trying to restrict the people of faith with legalistic limitations. And the reason I say this is because, listen, legalism not only results in the limitation of oppression that results in burdens uh, upon believers, and, and legalism not only results in the limitation of persecution, which, which ends up punishing the people of God, but listen, legalism also ultimately results in the limitation of restriction. And in order to explain what I mean by this, let's make our way back to Luke chapter 11, because here we find Christ Jesus. He's continuing to challenge the legalistic lawyer about his own hypocrisy. And if you would, let's pick up our study beginning at verse 52. Here the Lord rebukes this lawyer by declaring, woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves and those who were entering in, you hindered. And as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse him. Now, here in these verses, we find the Lord Jesus. He's presenting this third woe to that legalistic lawyer. And as we take a closer look at this third woe, we can see here that those, those legal experts, these lawyers who, who, who were providing people there in Israel with legal counsel, they were actually failing to comprehend the very scriptures that they were studying. They, they were studying the scriptures. They, they were examining the law, uh, but they didn't really understand the purpose of the law. And therefore, Jesus says that they were, they were failing to actually take, uh, you know, use the key of knowledge. Notice again uh, the way that Jesus puts it in verse 52. Here the Lord challenges them by declaring, you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves, and those who were entering, you hindered. In other words, they were failing to properly use the Old Testament uh, scriptures as the key of knowledge that it was intended to be. I'll help you to know that the word key found there in verse 52, it's actually translated from the same Greek word that Jesus used when he referred to the keys of the kingdom. There's a key here, a key of knowledge that the lawyers, the legal experts were failing to use properly. And in order to grasp the way that those lawyers were failing to use the key of knowledge, I want to consider something that Paul wrote in his letter to the Christians in Galatia. Hold your place here in the Gospel of Luke, and let's turn back in our Bibles to Galatians chapter 3. You see, it's here in the third chapter of Galatians where we find Paul. He's helping the Christians there in Galatia to understand the scriptures that were actually given for a very specific purpose. The scriptures, and, and specifically the Old Testament law, was given so that we can use it as a key of knowledge. And we, and we recognize that keys are designed to open things. Therefore, there's this key of knowledge that's found in the Old Testament scriptures, which was designed to open the door of salvation through the knowledge of our guilt. So let's, let's consider how Paul puts it here in Galatians chapter 3. You would look with me there beginning at verse 22. Here we learn that the scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we are kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith, which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now think about this for a moment. The scriptures were given to confine us under sin and to teach us about how sinful we actually are. 
The scriptures that contain the law of the Lord are supposed to serve then as our teacher, uh, which then teaches us about our need for the forgiveness that must be received by faith in Jesus Christ. And in this way, uh, the Old Testament law becomes the key of knowledge that unlocks the door so that we can then enter into salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. I like the way that Paul put it in 2 Timothy chapter 3. There he reminds Timothy about the way that the Holy Scriptures are able to make us wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. The Scriptures were given to serve as a key that unlocks uh, the door of salvation by helping us to see that it's by faith in Jesus Christ that we escape the condemnation of the law. The law of God is supposed to function then like a key of knowledge, which opens up this door of salvation. I like the way that King David put it in the 19th Psalm. It's Psalm 19, verse 7, where David says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Think about that for a moment. The law of the Lord, the law of God is perfect for the conversion of the soul. It's perfect for what it was intended for. The Lord gave us the law as a key of knowledge, which helps us to understand, number one, we're all lawbreakers. Number two, that we need forgiveness because we've broken the law. And as we come to grips with the fact that we are guilty before God, then the key of knowledge is designed to lead us to the foot of the cross where the gracious gift of forgiveness is received by faith in Jesus Christ. And with that being the case, it's sad to say that these lawyers there in Israel, uh, they spent their days studying the law. They spent their days understanding the Old Testament. They spent their time really getting a grasp on all of the laws found in the Old Testament, but they weren't using it as a key to open up a door. No, they were using the law as a bludgeon to to club people over the head. They were using the law of God to hinder people from entering in. With this in mind, let's turn back to Luke chapter 11 and let's take another look at the accusation that Jesus was making. It's there in verse 52 where again he declares, Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You do not enter in yourselves and those who were entering in, you hindered. That word hindered was translated from a Greek word which could also be rendered prevent, refuse, or forbid. They were taking the law of God and rather than using it as a key to open a door, They were taking the law of God and using it to prevent people from entering into the salvation of Jesus Christ. The same word uh, that's translated hindered, it stems from a root word which speaks of a restraining or a restricting through the threat of punishment. So they were taking the law and they were using it to restrict people and those who did not follow those restrictions, they were threatening with punishment. Rather than using the key of knowledge to help people see their need for salvation, These legalistic lawyers were using the word of God to restrain and restrict the people of God so that they could maintain their own control over the people of God. The proof of this, it's found here in our text today because this is exactly what they did to Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, look with me again there at Luke chapter 11, verse 53. Here Luke tells us that as he said these things to them, as he challenged them with these three woes, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things. Yep, Jesus was on trial. He was on trial and he was being cross-examined and they were taking the law and they were going through all 613 you know, you know, laws and saying, okay, let's, let's see where he's wrong. We know he's guilty. So now let's just prove it by catching him in some, some statement that, that is you know, in conflict with the, with the law. In verse 54, we learn that they were lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something that he might say that they might accuse him of. Rather than receiving the rebuke of the Lord Jesus Christ, these legalistic leaders proved his point. They proved his point by by attacking him and challenging him and questioning him. And they were looking for a way to accuse him according to the law of God so that they could use the law of God to put him to death. All the while they're failing to realize that the Lord Jesus is literally the incarnation of God's holy law. If you want to understand the holiness of God, look at the law. Because the law actually helps us to see the holiness of God. And here is the law of God incarnate. And they didn't recognize it. 
They spent all their time studying the law, but could not recognize the law incarnate when he stood right in their face. Instead, they used the law to try to restrict the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ because they were jealous. They were jealous of him, and they wanted to restrict his influence over the people of God, and so they took the law, and they tried to silence the incarnation of the law. And listen, legalism didn't stop there in the first century when Jesus died on the cross. Legalism didn't stop on the day when Stephen was stoned to death. No, legalism has continued, and, and, and we find it in the world today. There are legalistic people in the world today who are attempting to impose their legalistic restrictions on others so that they can somehow maintain their own personal power over people through their regulations and restrictions. In order to prove my point, I want to consider the warning that Paul presents in his letter to the Christians in Colossae. So if you would turn with me to Colossians chapter 2, and as you make your way to the second chapter of Colossians, I just want to take a moment to point out that legalistic people are are those who attempt to gain control over others uh, by using religious restrictions and regulations to try to take power uh, over the lives uh, of those who are struggling with those things, you know, that they're trying to restrict, And in this way, you know, these people who themselves are lawbreakers also, they place themselves upon a pedestal and they just begin to look down on on everybody else as they call out their restrictions on anybody, you know, who steps out of line. In this way, they're trying to take control over people. And it's sad to say that there are many people who allow themselves to be controlled by legalists. And there are Christians in the church today uh, who will submit themselves to legalists uh, in, in, in the hopes that maybe, you know, we'll, we'll appease these people who are clearly more holy than we are. And if that sounds like something that you struggle with, then I encourage you to recognize that legalism will not help you to become a better believer. And if you please them on one level, they'll just have another restriction for you. With this in mind, let's consider how Paul addresses this issue in the church. It's here in Colossians chapter 2. If you would look with me there, beginning at verse 20, because here Paul declares, If you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men? These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Read that again. They are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Is the indulgence of the flesh wrong? Yes. Is the indulgence of the flesh sinful? Yes. Will legalistic restrictions help you to overcome the indulgence of the flesh? Absolutely not. It cannot. And Paul here is helping those Christians in Colossae to understand that the religious regulations that legalistic leaders use to restrict us, it has no power to change our lives and it cannot make us better believers. Now, the restrictive rules of the legalists might seem wise to those you know, who are trying to overcome their sinful desires, and yet it's crucial for the Christian to realize that those who try to overcome sin by means of legalistic restrictions will only discover that these restrictions of legalism are powerless to change our lives. And what this means is this, that those who employ legalistic measures in order to achieve new levels of holiness will only end up disappointed at the end of the day. They might help for a small season. But those who engage in legalism, those who embrace legalistic restrictions, will only discover that the law actually lacks the power that we need to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. Now remember, the law is perfect. The law is perfect for what it was intended for, which is the conversion of the soul. But the law was not given for our sanctification. The law of God can no more help us to obey God any more than the speed limit sign can help us to drive the speed limit. Oh, you're driving down the road, you see the speed limit. And either you want to obey the speed limit or you don't. But the sign itself will not help you to obey the law. It can just tell you when you're breaking it. 
With that being the case, it's, it's crucial for Christians to understand that we can look at the law all day long. We can memorize the law. Uh, we, can, we can know, you know, at all, all the laws that, that, that the Bible, you know, presents us with and, and, and just have a very clear understanding of how many laws we're actually breaking. Because that's all it can do. With that being the case, we can rejoice in knowing that those who will simply walk by faith with Jesus Christ we will be given the spiritual strength that we need so that we can deny the sinful indulgences of our flesh. I think that Paul put it clearly in Galatians chapter 5 where he declares, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Walk in the Spirit, he says. He doesn't say walk in the law and you shall, fulfill, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He says walk in the Spirit and you're not under the law. Those who are walking in the Spirit will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And the reason why is this. The Holy Spirit will never lead you into a life of sin. If you will simply walk in the strength of the Holy Spirit, then the Spirit will always lead you to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord. Therefore, Paul assures us that those who are led by the Spirit are no longer under the law, and the reason why is because we're not doing anything that is in conflict with the law. Sadly, though, there are still many legalists who are quick to insist that, well, the restrictions of the law are necessary. The legalists will quickly, you know, speak up and say, well, you know, if you don't have the restrictions of the law, then people are just going to be able to go do whatever they want to do. They will insist that without the imposition of religious restrictions, the Christian just begins to engage in licentiousness. Now, just to be clear, licentiousness is based on the belief that the grace of God provides us with a license to sin. And there are many Christians who are living this sort of life. They, they think that, you know, because they receive the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they can just go do whatever they want to do. That they can go do things that are clearly stated as being sinful according to the scriptures. Listen, God's grace does not give us a license to sin. And I rejoice in knowing that any sins that I might commit tomorrow were already paid for on the cross of Jesus Christ. This, this gives me so much uh, uh, peace of mind in knowing that, you know, every day I don't have to go back to mass in the hopes that somehow this little wafer might just cleanse me a little bit more as I slowly get a little bit more of, of Christ's righteousness. No, 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 no. At the moment of salvation, you receive the imputation of Christ's righteousness. All of your sins, past, present, and future, taken care of on the cross. Praise the Lord for that. Does this now give me a, a, a green light to just go about living in sin? Absolutely not. Licentiousness is completely off base. But the solution for licentiousness isn't the polar opposite, which is legalism. Because legalism will not help me to stop my sinful desires. But if we would simply walk in the Spirit then we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And in this way, we have liberty, true liberty, over our sinful nature. I like the way that Paul puts it in Galatians chapter 5. It's here where Paul responds to the lies of the legalists by declaring this. He says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Here we find Paul encouraging Christians to walk in the liberty of the Lord, which is a bit of a tricky topic because I think there's a lot of Christians who use this word liberty and, and use it as a basis for licentiousness. You know, for, for example, there's a lot of Christians who, you know, they continue getting drunk on alcohol and they say that God's given them the liberty to do this. Listen, I had the liberty to get drunk before I came to Christ. So why is it that, that now in Christ I have the liberty to, to drink? That doesn't make any sense. Before I came to Christ, I had liberty to drink. 
So then what is my liberty in Christ Jesus? Except I've been liberated from alcohol. The Lord Jesus gives me the liberty to not drink. Before, I was going to get drunk. But now in Christ, I've been liberated. My liberty is that I no longer have to drink. I no longer have to smoke marijuana. I no longer have to look at the pornography. I no longer have to do these things in my life. I've been freed from it. I've been set free. That's my liberty in Jesus Christ, and that's the liberty that you can enjoy as well. So Paul says, don't use your liberty as a cloak for vice. Don't use your liberty as a basis for continuing in sin. No, instead, love one another according to the scriptures. And as we walk in love according to the liberty of the Lord, we are set free from the condemnation of the law. And and, and while some might see this liberty from the condemnation of of the law as a license to sin, Paul assures us that that is not true, that those who are truly walking in liberty will end up fulfilling the law of God. Why? Because of legalistic restrictions? No. But because as we walk in love, we end up fulfilling the law of God. To sum it all up, listen, the limitations of legalism are entirely ineffective and therefore unable to change our lives. If you want to become more like Christ, don't grab a hold of a bunch of legalistic restrictions. They can't change you. Instead, walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, and he will guide you in the true liberty of the Lord. But listen, if you find yourself on the receiving end of someone else's legalism, uh, then you ought to inform that individual that their legalism isn't going to make you a better believer. You see, legalism always results in the limitation of oppression as believers end up being burdened with rules and restrictions that are beyond everyone's ability to keep. Uh, Legalism will also result in the limitation of persecution as legalistic people begin to punish those who are failing to follow all of their rules. And legalism will always result in the limitation of restrictions as the freedom of liberty is replaced uh, by a path that leads us back into the bondage of the law. And with that being the case, I encourage every Christian to ignore the legal experts in our lives. Ignore the legal experts who come along and just say, well, here, look, you're, you're, you're this and this is what that says and you're doing it all wrong. And just let them know, well, you're doing it all wrong wrong right now by being a legalist. We don't really need to pay a a lot of attention to the legalists who are trying to convince us that in order for us to become better believers, that we have to do exactly what they say we ought to be doing. At the same time, though, I also encourage those of us with these legalistic tendencies, which is probably all of us, Those of us with legalistic tendencies need to remember that the Lord isn't calling us to the position of Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit knows how to do his job. And yeah, there's going to be times when the Holy Spirit uses us in someone else's life to bring that word of challenge and and, and iron sharpens iron. I love all of that. But there are some people who just think that their job is being the Holy Spirit in everybody's life. And so they walk around with their rule book and they're checking boxes and making sure everybody's in line according to their restrictions. I'm here to tell you the Lord is not calling us to step up and act as the Holy Spirit in the lives of others. Christian, listen, the Holy Spirit knows how to do his job. He's been doing it a long time. And he knows how to convict the hearts of his people as he sanctifies us and makes us more like Jesus. Listen, before you decide to lay your legalistic rules on another brother or sister in Christ, just remember that the Lord might be doing a work in the life of that person, which is based on an entirely different list of priorities than yours. I remember as a brand new believer, I I, I can't even tell you the whole list of things I was addicted to, but just, you know, imagine the list and it's probably that. And I remember, you know, as soon as church was over, you know, I'd sat there for 30 minutes of worship and a 45-minute Bible study, and I hadn't smoked a cigarette the whole time. And I was smoking three packs a day at that point in time. And as soon as that last song was done, I was out the door smoking my cigarettes. And I'm so glad that not one Christian ever came up to me and, was, and, and just pulled the trip of, how can you smoke a cigarette outside the church and run around Jesus would hate this. And the Lord was helping me overcome pornography. The Lord was helping me overcome alcohol and marijuana and and drug addiction. The Lord was helping me to overcome things that were way worse than smoking a cigarette in front of a church. 
And so be careful when you see someone who might be struggling with a little bit of, a, uh, of sin and you think that you've got to step in and say something. You might not, you might not realize this, that, that, that God might be dealing with something way bigger than that in their life right now. I remember when I was on staff at Calvary Austin. And I knew the situation of a certain lady who had come to our church. She had come to the faith in Jesus Christ and, and she had been a prostitute for many years. And her clothing reflected her, her, her last job. She didn't have, you know, clothing that, you know, the, the average Christian would, you know, think was right on. She, she still kind of dressed like a prostitute. That was her wardrobe. And I remember walking up on one lady approaching this former prostitute, brand new believer. And this lady, how, can, how dare you come in here dressed like that and blah, blah, blah. And I just pulled this lady off to the side, this caring, compassionate Christian. I didn't say caring, I said caring, compassionate Christian. And I said, you don't, even, you don't even know her background. You don't even know the life that she came out of. And you're gonna sit here and, and judge her clothing. Why don't, why don't you love her enough to you know, maybe take her down to the store and buy her some new clothes. Legalism is sad and it doesn't help anyone to become a better believer. Let's be compassionate with one another as we're all struggling with sin. We're all struggling. And so if you see me and I'm struggling with, you know, speed limit stuff, I see you and you're struggling with, you know, whatever it is you're struggling with. We're all struggling. Look, I, I struggle with great pride about the beard that, that God has given me, you know. Like, but, but God's working on me. Like, I, I get it. Not everybody can have such a luxurious beard. But, but, but seriously, though, we need to be compassionate and realize that we're all a work in progress, amen? So before we pull out our list of rules and restrictions and, and attempt to beat one another up, let's just realize that maybe God's doing something in the life of this person that we can't even see and dealing with things that are way worse than whatever we just saw. Let's pray for one another and let's be compassionate with one another and, and, and be understanding that we're all a work in progress. Let's curb our own legalistic tendencies by giving God the room to work in the hearts of our brothers and our sisters in Christ. And as we do, the Lord will enable us to have an incredible church, which is a place that is free from the limitations of legalism.